OK, well, good afternoon and um, I hope everyone can hear me and uh, well, uh, Ian and Mary really set the scene for uh, reconsidering or rethinking or reimagining uh, political economy and the way we understand how things work, uh, how the world works, how our economies work, how they interact with societies and the environment. And I'd basically like to make two points. The first is um, about challenging conventional wisdom, uh, of which Mary and Ian discussed a lot about uh, lines being crossed. And with the COVID-19 crisis, we see a lot of lines being crossed and uh, new ideas or ideas that would have been considered subversive, but actually now it's um, it's becoming quite mainstream. And then the second point is that um, there, there has been a dramatic shift in a whole range of policies and measures that we've taken in response to COVID, but there's also a sense that those things should only be temporary. Uh, they should be used to fight this crisis, but then we should get back to normal. And uh, I'd like to really question whether that should be the case. Well, uh, my name is William Hines, and uh, I'm the head of the New Approaches to Economic Challenges Unit in the OECD. And Paul Krugman once said that the OECD is conventional wisdom central. And um, he actually meant that as a compliment that actually it makes a lot of sense to have some common understanding and uh, we're all on the same page on things and therefore we can have shared approaches and common goals. But um, Danny Roderick and others have said that by the time something becomes conventional wisdom, it's almost always wrong because so many of the caveats and limitations have been shoved aside. And uh, I think one thing that's clear from uh, the COVID-19 crisis is that we do really need to think about how our economy works. And the conventional wisdom is that essentially an economy is a closed equilibrium system where if we just get the structural policy settings like flexibility in labor markets or competition in product markets, if we get these settings right, then the market will self-organize in a way which will be good for growth and that will somehow trickle down so that it'll also be good for people. And um, I think we really need to rethink this because we've seen in this crisis that uh, it's actually a very complex system that, that is prone to break down, that shocks can emerge from the system and can really disperse. And um, we really need to think about the interconnected nature and complexity of all these human made systems, which turn out to be very vulnerable to shocks. And um, that's related to economic and financial shocks, populist revolt, cyber attacks, natural disasters, pandemics, and all of these things are amplified now by the, the way in which the world economy is interconnected and is beset by overarching trends like inequality, monopoly power, climate, etc. So um, Thomas Friedman in the New York Times recently wrote an article about how we broke the world. And uh, he said that over the last 20 years, we've been steadily removing man-made and natural buffers, redundancy, regulations and norms that provide resilience and protection when big systems, ecological, geopolitical and financial get stressed. And we've removed these out of an obsession with short term efficiency and growth uh, or without thinking at all. And uh, I think this is one of the, the big trade offs that we now see that we've essentially built a lot of our human made systems to fail. They've been built for efficiency and uh, in this rethink of the political economy, we really need to look at this conventional wisdom. We have a global system which is faster, deeper, cheaper, tighter than ever before, but we really have to ask whether that serves all our interests. Which brings me to my second point, which is um, the dramatic changes that we've seen. And again, a lot of the conventional wisdom has been swept aside. The idea that the state owes everyone a living, the, the social democratic uh, a premise is basically now accepted by everyone. Uh, we see that when we're hit with a shock like this, it's up to the state to really step in uh, to provide people with the, the buffers and the safeguards to help businesses and the private sector to redirect resources to uh, deal with public problems. And a lot of this cuts across what was conventional wisdom, that in fact, what was needed was incremental change and market based instruments to solve a lot of these problems, that the state should have a very limited role, that it shouldn't intervene in picking winners through industrial strategy, that um, we should let the market decide, and uh, that there was no ammunition for uh, expansionary monetary and fiscal policy, that we we used all the ammunition. And so all of these things have been proved not to be accurate. 
and also in terms of behavior of people about what people wouldn't be willing to accept. Well, it seems that people will accept a lot of sacrifice if you're faced with this uh, type of uh, problem and only the state with a very strong public um, interest, deep structural change, can we actually deal with a problem like COVID-19. So uh, we need to make sure that this isn't just an emergency response and that the we put the economy into a medically induced coma, but when we wake up, we should just go back to normal. I think it actually means that we really need to rethink macroeconomics uh, about maybe entertain ideas like uh, modern monetary theory and at least experiment with these ideas to look at how the state can affect deep structural change and coordinate both public and private institutions in new ways. Uh, that we shouldn't build things for efficiency. We should also think about other systemic properties. And above all, what I see in the policymaking discussion is there's this sense that we need to fix things up and uh, then get back on the road to disaster. But uh, maybe as part of this rethink, we need to look at where we're going and um, that everything is on the table now and we can actually have more dramatic policy responses. So um, that's, I think, uh, all I want to say. Just to conclude, I think COVID-19 certainly clarifies the challenges that we face and there are many other systemic threats ahead. Uh, and ultimately, the decisions we must take uh, these are not something we can avoid. We will be struck by these systemic uh, issues sooner or later. And the fate of the world economy hinges not on what the virus does, but on how we choose to respond. So thanks. Um, thank you very much, William. Um, that was that was excellent. It was concise and comprehensive. Um, hi, um, I'm Claude Harris. For those of you who might have just joined us now, and I'm in the Department of Government and Politics in UCC. And just to follow on from the excellent arguments that William has just made, where he's you know uh, you know he's called for us to rethink macroeconomics and indeed to think to to look and as part of that rethink to look at where we're going because of the many systemic threats that are that I suppose that are ahead of us that we currently face. And what I want to do is look at this more from the position of a democratic position, because really we are the people who should have input to these decisions. And it is important, I suppose, in, in a dem democracy that the control rests or indeed input comes from the citizens. So I suppose re really um, what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is talk a little bit about ways in which maybe we can reimagine or rethink our democratic systems or our political systems. So um, as, as William has touched upon there, and I was, as was discussed earlier in the conversation between Ian and Mary, democracy along with other social institutions is currently having to face numerous crises. And you could argue that it's, it itself is facing a crisis in the so-called democratic malaise, which we see as characterised by declining levels of participation in traditional forms of politics, such as joining political parties, in lower levels of low levels of trust in politicians and democratic institutions, declining levels of social capital and the emergence of anti-politics. And as Schott argues, we are in a moment of deep transition. And this presents us both with an opportunity for renewal for that rethink that was mentioned, but also it's a time of danger, possibly in terms of providing a vacuum that toxic undemocratic leaders may fill. So when we come to that rethink, we need to be at the table as, as citizens and as Democrats. So part of the work of the project that we the, the, the DIAS project is to focus on democracy as a social institution that is in need of critique and reimagining, particularly if it is to address the climate emergency in a manner that is sustainable and just and facilitates human development. And our, I suppose our work argues that a definition of a good social institution or a good institution emphasises values of justice, sustainability, partnership and deliberation, ethical and effective leadership and the ability to drive positive institutional and societal change for the common good. In the work that Dr Ian Hughes and I have been doing on democracy, and um, we draw on, on definitions from David Beetham et al, where the, the focus is on popular control over political leaders on one hand, and equality of respect and voice between citizens in the exercise of that control on the other. We're also informed very much by the work of Arshan Fong and Eric Golan Wright that, views, that argues that democratic politics involves facilitating active uh, political involvement of the citizenry, forging political consensus through dialogue, devising and implementing public policies that ground a productive economy and healthy society. So very much interlinking that need for a healthy society as well as a productive economy. And we're 
very taken to by the, though our work is very much in keeping or recognising the arguments by Wendy Brown, who recognises that several decades of neoliberal orthodoxy has meant that the exercise of political power is increasingly deprived of modulation by informed deliberation, compromise, accountability and legitimation by the will of the people. Instead, what we are seeing, and I quote from her, real politique rules with the result that raw manoeuvring, deal making, branding, spinning and indifference to facts, argument and truth all further dis discredit the political and further disorient populations about the value or meaning of democracy. So at this moment of deep transition, we argue that democracy not only needs not only requires its existing institutions to be strengthened, but it needs reimagining if it is to tackle the many crises it faces. For half a century, we have seen deliberative, and for almost half a century, we've seen deliberative and participatory democratic innovations such as citizens' juries, citizens' assemblies, participatory budgeting, and so forth, demonstrating the feasibility of new democratic practices that empower citizens and influence policy. And we only have to look at the Irish Citizens' Assembly, the recent French Convention of Citizens' Convention on the Climate, the Climate Assembly UK, to for examples of how citizen deliberation is already shaping climate policies of national governments. As a deliberative democratic innovation, these assemblies emphasise informed, reasoned, respectful and considered judgment amongst a small, randomly selected but representative group of citizens. And their work may or can result in what Arthur and Prius would argue are fact, future and other regarding recommendations. In this way, they can, as Dreisek et al argue, be a powerful segment of the wider democratic system and contribute to the slow politics required to tackle intractable policy challenges that need long term solutions impervious to short term electoral cycles. Yet they are not and cannot be the panacea for all that ails modern democracy. It is widely recognised that the goals of deliberation cannot be met in any one institution and that deliberation can and indeed must occur in multiple locations and involve a diversity of actors. What is required, um, to borrow a phrase from Oliver Escobar, is a vibrant democratic ecology that is holistic, collaborative, empowering and progressive and involves a combination of participatory, deliberative, associational, direct and representative forms of democracy. Arguably, each could act to enhance the strengths and redress the shortcomings of the other. Within this ecology, we see a particular role for the participatory and deliberative democratic innovations. In particular, we argue for the development of new spaces where citizens are invited to revisit the meaning of democracy and their role as citizens in collectively shaping democracy in their country and the world. In essence, to reimagine and co-design the vibrant democratic ecology best suited to their society. And this is particularly true in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also for the other systemic challenges that we face and are, are, are due to face, no doubt, in the future. It should, for example, include citizens assemblies, but it should not draw exclusively from them and should involve other forms of democracy too, such as associational, direct, participatory and deliberative and representative institutions and processes. Ireland has shown itself to be a world leader in its use of citizens assemblies and with our history of partnership, collaboration, peace building and consensus making, we are ideally placed to pioneer such an approach. So to conclude, um, democracy's ability to reimagine itself and the success it has in so doing may be our only hope in developing the slow fact future and other regarding politics and policies required to tackle the multiple crises we face and develop societies that are stronger, fairer, more sustainable and ones in which people can thrive rather than merely survive. And as I wrap up, I'm just going to gently remind you to please post any questions you have for us on the on the um the page here on the live q a page too thank you very much i'll pass over now to my colleague uh, kieran kuhan hi there uh am i online can you hear me can you hear me yes yes kieran we can hear you yeah thank yeah. you very much all right okay um well wow, this is very interesting there's so much food for thought uh, can i just pick up on a few uh a few little moments from, from Mary McAleese's talk. Um, 
and it's the idea of the strong arm. Uh, we'll just think about that for, for, for a second, you know. Um, wh what are the conditions under which the arrival of the strong arm becomes uh, becomes kind of commonplace, you know, and uh, it suggests the struggle and the strife and all of that. Well, the most striking image of the strong arm, of course, in in, in politics is um, at the end of Hamlet, the, the drama, uh, Shakespeare's drama, which, of course, is is about a period of great transition and conflict, you know, between the monarchy and the emerging parliament and so on, all of this period of liminality. And everything devolves into corruption and violence and so on. And then there's the great bloodbath at the end. Everybody stabs everybody else, you know, which uh, is, is uh, whatever. And then what happens? You know, well, then you have interstage left, interstage right, I think it is, uh, Fortinbras. Fortinbras' name actually is Fortinbras, the strength and arm, the strong arm, you know. So it's as the institutions of politics fall into a kind of a chaos, fall into uh, uh, violence and so on and so forth, that you have, as it were, the popular expectation. Shakespeare was writing for the crowd there. He was writing for his audience. People want the strong man to enter into a situation when things are falling apart and so on. And that's really the great danger we have at the moment. It's the danger of the interregnum. You know, interregnum means between kings. So we don't quite know what the rule is. And it's in that context you have, as it were, the popular demand for uh, somebody come and sort this out, call in the general, Fortinbras and so on. And this is kind of what we're seeing all over the, the world and so on today. The, the second thing I really liked in what uh, Mary's uh, talk was, because we now we know we have to watch for, we have to watch for not just Fortinbras invasion, but the popular demand that Fortinbras arrive and sort this thing out for us and so on. The second thing she said, of course, was the lovely story about the uh, the referendum and what changes in the referendum. And she talked about how the stories, the stories that are told and shared around kitchen tables and so on and so forth, open up the possibility uh, for transformation, a kind of a flood of grace in the community, I think was she said. So we should think about that. You know, what we're really looking at is that this is all about stories, the stories that can be told and the story, the possibility of new stories and so on, and how the exchange of stories, the, the sharing of those stories can actually create the conditions of possibility for some sort of greater transformation. This, of course, exactly, I think, at least what I hear in a lot of uh, what William was saying about the way in which, you know, macroeconomics and political economy generally is kind of really constituted by a, a constellation of stories. And there are dominant stories. And we've had a sort of series of dominant narratives for ever so long now. We call that broadly like the, the narrative of neoliberalism, you know, uh, included in that a particular kind of narrative about the nature of the human being, you know, as homo economicus and so on. A narrative about the state that, you know, we, a story about the state. We really shouldn't have Friedman's story about the state, that the state is a kind of a, an imposition and at best it should be just a referee and so on. So we have an opportunity when those stories are disrupted and people say, well, we just can't believe that kind of crap anymore. We need a new set of, uh, set of stories. So there is a possibility there in opening up of the possibility of new stories. But we can't forget the extent to which the people who have been telling the dominant stories for the longest time now are a very, very powerful group of narrators, you know, and they have, I mean, I'm thinking of like the Montparlin Society, uh, the Koch brothers, the Cato in Institute, all, you know, Robert Mercer, all of that crew, they have stories that they want to reimpose at exactly this moment. So um, even though their stories are slightly disrupted, they can pick up the narrative, and this is going back to the status quo ante, you know. Well, as I was saying before the coronavirus merely interrupted us there for a moment, this is the story. So we really need to think about the, the opportunity, but it's a very fragile opportunity to tell new stories uh, in this uh, context. So I'm, I'm wondering then, what are the stories that we need to tell and share and exchange with one another now to, uh, to, to, to sort of make a, 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 a difference? Um, now, I'm only kind of seeing if I can lay out some general parameters here, some general ideas and so on, but that might give us the basis on which we can tell new kinds of stories. And the first thing maybe I would say about new stories is, well, how new is new? You know, because we, we, we're, our project is uh, the deep, deep institutional transformation and imagining, reimagining institutions and so on. We have to think about well, what imagination is. And imagination, this is Vico, uh, imagination is simply the resurfacing of recollections and ingenuity is simply the elaboration of things remembered. So that's kind of Vico explicitly. There is also Nietzsche, it's also even, even Plato, that idea, you know, that what we have to do is kind of remember 
old stories, but in new ways. The, the, the big risk we have at the moment is everybody's expecting something brand new, hot off the presses and so on and so forth. That doesn't happen. Charles Taylor, the Canadian philosopher, tells us that basically, you know, uh, the, 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 nothing happens like that. Institutional change doesn't happen uh, by ex nihilo or uh, something. It has to be a, a reworking of traditions, a reworking of ideas and so on and so forth. And that's even interesting in relation to what the Ian and Mary's conversation as well. Something like, well, what role does the inheritance of a religious tradition or traditions of spirituality have in this? How can we reimagine those? How can we tell those stories in new ways and so on? So let's just park that for a moment because the, the keys to the stories that I think we can possibly tell are come from Plato, a guy called René Girard, uh, a German legal philosopher called Carl Schmitt, uh, uh, you know, that can, can tell one sort of set of stories that we've been laboring under for the longest time now. And then another guy who we probably haven't heard of at all, he's a, an anthropologist called Marcel Mauss. And I'll say a little bit about all of those. How am I doing? Am I gone over time? How long have I got? I can't hear. Anybody interrupt me? Um, okay. I don't know, Karen. Give yourself a few more minutes, anyway. It's fascinating. Okay, okay. Let me. Well, maybe I'll just stay at the top level then, and 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 talk about those uh, ideas. Um, I guess the next thing we'd want to say is deep. What do we mean by deep? Deep, deep institutional transformation. Uh, we're 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 now living in a moment, a moment of uh, news, a moment of hyper modernity, acceleration, and so on and so forth. Whereas when we think deep, we have to think historically and anthropologically deep. Things that are deeply human, things that are about human flourishing. And Gerard's book on this is called Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World. Now this is a guy who's the the dion or let's say guru for uh, the American right. He's a favorite of uh, these uh, people, very, very powerful uh, intellectual, but also influential in this way. He's an arch conservative. He's a deep Catholic, arch conservative restorationist. And this is his model. His model is, well, we need a restoration of monarchy. Now, we, we can't restore the monarchies, but we need a restoration of a kind of a form of oligarchy. You know, so uh, uh, if you like a small cast, a 0.1% or whatever, if we can almost transform these people into uh, demigods, you know, then you have the basis of a new order and so on. And this is a this is a popular view amongst these uh, these uh, people. The challenge is to think about how do we turn it around. Uh, uh, Here's what I found. Sorry, I got an interruption. Uh, how do we turn it around? Now that takes us back to Plato, the idea of, you know, well, you have to think about a metanoia, you know, which is a kind of a turning of the soul and his whole project on education there. Now, Plato and Gerard are kind of similar in that way. They want to restore uh, an order, an order of Fortinbras with a kind of a new oligarchy of the Davos class or whatever you want to call them and so on. So this is what we're up against. These are the stories that are being told. Even we have a short, small opportunity to change that around. And that story, the possibility of a new story is actually another deep anthropological idea. And that's from Marcel Mauss, conceiving of society as a total system of exchanges uh, constituting a, a, a virtuous uh, uh, spiral. Now, I, I've, I've gone over my five minutes by quite a bit, so I think I'll really have to stop it at that. But maybe we can take up any of those suggestions. I'd particularly like to explain the mouse piece in the uh, in, in any uh, question and answer. So thanks for that. Sorry for going over. All right. Thanks, right. Uh, thanks very much, uh, first of all, for for the invitation and uh, and the you know fascinating and, and, and very inspiring conversation we have had so far. Um, uh, my name is Ernst. I'm uh, the guest from the Humanistic Management Network and Humanistic Management Center. And um, uh, being the last speaker, I have the advantage that I can kind of tweak my message a little in order to uh, be as much in conflict or not as I want with, with the previous speakers. And uh, I, But I don't think I am. And I'll, I'll be quick, though, and I'll want you, if Tara can put on my slide, uh, we can... Uh, go on a, on a very brief uh, experiential learning uh, journey, if you want, where we're first looking at the at knowledge or mental models that we're having, um, and, and next we're reflecting on those uh, to move on to conceptualize and then experiment and, and implement. So if we're staying with the first one uh, for the moment, then uh, we have a, a mental model that we need for, for institutional change, I believe, that is more about balancing 
uh, different aspects rather than maximizing single aspects. Uh, and William has talked, uh, you know, greatly about uh, the, um, uh, the the question of resilience versus efficiency. And I think uh, we need to come to terms uh, with the fact that trade-offs are to be had. Uh, when I'm talking to people from the business community, uh, quite often you hear um, sayings like, "We well, with our investment, we will maximize uh, environmental, social, and financial returns." And uh, and and I, I I always shake my head and say, "Like, no, um, you you cannot maximize simultaneously things that are in conflict with each other." And uh, and uh, hyper efficiency creates fragility, and we cannot think that we will be able to uh, build back after after the pandemic, after the current uh, experiences uh, in a way that we will stay just as efficient or even more so and whilst becoming super resilient at the same time. So I think the first part on mental models that I want to highlight is that uh, trade-offs are uh, something we need to accept and we need to work towards a balancing uh, rather than trying to maximize things at the same time that can't be maximized uh, jointly because they, they are inherently in conflict with each other. Um, so that is the first. If we're then moving on from this mental model that is that is changing from a maximization paradigm to a paradigm of balancing, um, we can then reflect and see, well, what is it that we need balance on? And I think there are two macro challenges we're confronted with uh, today. Uh, first is the environmental challenge, which is symbolized by the little globe there. And, and the second macro challenge is the challenge of distribution. And our environmental challenge, it was highlighted also climate change, of course, the most dominant one, but uh, there, there's many more. There's air quality, water quality, uh, biodiversity, you name it. We can list it a lot more, but there's this whole complex of, uh, of environmental challenges. And secondly, distribution. Uh, distribution, of course, income comes first uh, to our mind, but it is more general, I think, uh, um, distribution of opportunities in life. And if you want to uh, use the, the, the capabilities approach um, uh, and you, you can say opportunities to live the life one chooses to live or one uh, thinks is, is the life that they are uh, wanting to or desiring to live. And uh, again, if we're looking at the current pandemic, uh, it becomes very obvious that even in, in illness, even with the pandemic, uh, distributional impact is huge. If we're looking at racial distribution of, of people dying of, of, of COVID-19, if we're looking at income distribution of people dying at COVID-19, if we're looking at regional geographic distribution, it is very clear that this pandemic is not affecting people equally over the world. So uh, distribution clearly linked to what we're experiencing uh, currently. If we're moving on to the next one, Tara, please, then we have the conceptualization and there, uh, you know, there's many ways of framing it, but I want to highlight one element here is that both of these challenges, I think, uh, we, you know, we will we will solve them, uh, no doubt. I mean, humanity is not going to go under uh, because of these. Uh, not quite yet, at least. Um, so we, we will solve them. But I think we need to accept and become aware and conceptualize in a way that we co-create solutions between different societal actors. We're used to having, you know, the, the policy makers and then we have the business people and we have the civil society organizations and they're all in their silos and, and uh, you know, civil society organizations blame business for being money uh, grabbing greedy organizations and the business people should back that, uh, you know, it's easy to talk if you don't uh, have to survive in cutthroat competitive uh, markets and the policymakers are stuck between lobbyists and uh, and the mandate of the electorate and everyone blames each other uh, for, for the failures and that is not going to cut it. So we need to come to terms and organize and conceptualize for co-creation so that we can actually tap the, the knowledge, the competences, the ingenuity, the creativity of different societal sect sectors in order to uh, successfully address the challenges we're confronted with. And then the last one is the, the implementation uh, part where, um, you know, from the humanistic management perspective, our offer is that we're saying, uh, what does this mean for business organizations? It means uh, to depart from a singular focus of, of profit maximization as the reason of being for an organization, for a business. We need to 
um, bring means and ends into a into a reasonable and productive relationship again. Um, the profit maximization paradigm leads us to think that businesses exist to maximize profit, and in order to do so, they need to uh, um, somehow produce goods or services that are appealing to their customers. Uh, in humanistic management, we say it's exactly the other way around. Uh, businesses exist in order to uh, produce goods and services that are uh, genuinely addressing human needs, that are helping people to live more successful, more fulfilled, uh, more happy lives. And in order to do so, of course, a business needs to earn money. Uh, profitability is part of being sustainable, but profitability is a means and not an end in itself. And for humanistic management, we then defined our three-stepped approach, which is first based, and that comes back to the um, talk about uh, human rights is based on respect for the dignity of life. Uh, so the dignity of life is the foundation for why we have the human rights in the first place. Uh, the second step is the integration of ethical considerations in uh, management decisions. We've also had touched upon that in, in the previous uh, talks. This essentially means uh, that we should build things in a way they don't break so e easily rather than building things in a way that we know they will break and then have to uh, invest a lot to fix them. And third step is to engage actively with, with stakeholders. Uh, talk to the people that are affected by decisions so that we can have a dialogue and a de deliberation uh, on, on alternative courses of conduct. And once we're doing this implementation and experimenting with that, we can, we can go back uh, to the first step uh, and, and adjust and adapt our, our knowledge and our um, mental models. And with that, the loop closes. And uh, with that, uh, also, I will hand back to, to William. And, and thanks very much for having me. Sorry, William, you just have to unmute yourself, please. Thank you. OK, I think it's unmuted now. So um, do we have any questions from the audience? Or from any of the other speakers? If, if there is no other question, I, I, I have one uh, that is troubling me with, with much of this because we've, we've heard it also uh, on, on uh, you know, the, the, what, what might the response be to trigger transformation. And, and we're, we're often then looking at, at the deliberation, at stakeholder engagement, at a dialogical process, essentially. But I'm, I'm troubled there by what I label the asymmetry of speed. I'm troubled by the fact that, especially if we're looking at, at uh, tech companies, at uh, private sector organizations that, that are moving at a speed that is greatly faster than our democratic processes of, of deliberation, of deciding what we want and what we don't want are. And how can we either slow down uh, the, the um, uh, one side or speed up the other side is, is something that, that uh, I, don't know how to uh, address it within these these thoughts that I'm having. Okay, thanks, Ernst. Yes. Yeah, sorry. There are a number of questions as well. I see from those the, those who have joined us today. If, if I, I might um, just maybe read through one or two of them, if that's okay. Um, sorry, one moment now. Of course, the screen has gone just blank on me. Yes, um, I, I, maybe what I might do, I see that there's one for each of my fellow panellists. There's a question here for you, William. There are many questions. Um, for example, here, William, please give your thoughts on state tools to intervene for deep public interest. For example, applying conditionality to investments, ensuring social value. And do you think something like this would be used in the recovery stimulus policy? package and then there's another um, question uh, William about how close do you think we may be to a Berlin Wall moment of change in economic thinking if at all and how likely is that such a tipping point may lead to the development of some of the, the ideas that you have in your OECD Nike, Nike report um, and uh, 
then Ernst, there's a question here um, as well on seeking balance over um, the impossibility of maximising all domains mean that mental, including corporate models of sustainability, look like triple bottom line or interlocking circles or triple pillars that are not only out of sync with reality, but potentially dangerous. And um, I suppose, Kieran, I was going to to ask you about um, if you wouldn't mind at some stage elaborating on, on um, Mar Marcel Mauss, um, but I think there might be another question from one of the panellists as a wrap up to that. Um, so I'll, I'll now stand back and you can um, perhaps, William, you might answer first if that's OK. Sure, yeah. Um, well, uh, are we close to a, a Berlin Wall moment? Well, it's I, pr probably not at the moment. I mean, it, it, if anything is proved as a human system to be very resilient, it is the economic orthodoxy or the sort of neoclassical approach to economics. Um, I think there was a window after the last global financial crisis for changing things. I think that window very rapidly closed. Um, and so at least in the world of policy, I think the existing paradigm has not been in any way displaced. And uh, I think we, because of the internal incentives and uh, people like James Heckman and Paul Romer have wrote about this, but um, the fact that there is this deference to authority within economics and uh, there is a, a dominance of certain ideas which um, are extremely difficult to displace. So I'm, I think th this crisis really helps and uh, it does change the narratives, what Kiron was saying, in the sense that um, you know, this idea of these multiple objectives that we have, that certainly the idea of maximizing economic growth has been displaced as a central policy. But to Ernst's point about trade-offs, it's my view that trade-offs um, really became part of the discussion uh, after the last crisis. Um, but I have some problems with that. Like we did try and move to concepts like green growth and inclusive growth, and we essentially took the pre-crisis model and we adapted it, we amended it, we figured out what was missing and uh, we tried to improve it, but it's still the, the same basis. It's still uh, fundamentally the same. It's just that we've added things to it. We've bolted them on to the, the standard model. And that's where state tools, trade-offs between different objectives. I think the problem with trade-offs in a sense is that it's really suitable for a linear framework. And so for example, you've had some countries that have tried to essentially trade off uh, the um, COVID-19 with economic growth, that well, we'll open up a little bit or open up prematurely, but you, you can't have that sort of framework with something that's exponential uh, because the infection, you open up a little and then the infection takes off in an exponential way. So it, trade offs are not always that useful because of the complexity of the systems that we're, we're doing. And the other thing to mention is that in optimization, um, if we're optimizing these complex systems, then we can be making them unstable. So again, it's not just that we will try to trade off growth for other objectives, that um, our problems could be created endogenously by the pursuit of uh, economic growth. So I'll perhaps leave it there. Sorry, I see that our time is tight. Ernst and Karen, do you want to each maybe make a uh, reply to those comments? Um, maybe Ernst first. Yes, yes, sure. Um, I'm, I'm reading the question and I'm, I'm having a, a bit of a, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand it, but but essentially um, to, to answer it maybe, maybe broadly would be to uh, to say what, what we, we know what we're having now doesn't work, right? So we know that we need a deep transformation, we need change, we need institutional uh, adaptation and uh, and I don't see, I, I see the greatest danger in not doing anything. I see the greatest danger in, in not changing rather than um, saying that, you know, a triple bottom line gives us a dangerous sense of, of security. Um, the greatest danger, I think, is not not going for something new, is, is not experimenting and, and trying. And, and we will certainly create, uh, with anything we do, we will create new challenges and new problems that we don't see 
uh, in at the time that we're that we're implementing it. So we can only always uh, do the best we can from the from the knowledge and the perspective and the the uh, um, the position that we are in today. Uh, but doing nothing uh, cannot be the uh, cannot be the the alternative. So um, I I think the most dangerous would be inertia rather than uh, trying something that uh, we don't know for sure will work. Thank, thank you. And um, Kieran, are Kieran, are you still with us? Hello. I wonder. It would it would seem that yep. we. Hello. Oh, hi, Kieran. There's a question here actually um, for you. Um, what are the elements of this new story that we need, and who or how should it be told? Yeah, no, that's a really interesting interesting question. It's a big story, uh, and uh, I. I I, I can't do it in two minutes, if you know what I mean, but uh, the, a key figure to it in it would be the, the, the anthropologist I mentioned, Marcel Mauss, you know, which is the idea of rethinking almost kind of fundamentally in a deep anthropological way, what is the kind of nature of human exchange in a total system? Because one of the problems we have in the present is, of course, that we treat economy as a, you know, uh, to use an earlier term, a sort of hermetic uh, discourse, a discourse onto itself, and there's no other way of engaging with it. And of course, the story we have been told all the time Time for the last 30 years now is there is no alternative, you know, that there's just one story and there's no alternative to it and so on. So that's the enormity that William is talking about that, that we're kind of up against, you know, you have to see, well, how do you begin to refute that story? Do you take it on on, on kind of a, on a small way, in a piecemeal way? Do you make small adjustments and so on? Or can you offer something very, very different all, all, altogether? Now, one can, but, you know, the, 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 the people who are telling that story have another plan. And, and that's the story of Carl Schmitt, you know, that basically says politics is about making uh, distinctions between friends and enemies. And really what the politics of the present is about, uh, and, and it'll use the crisis to do this, is about actually breaking democracy. You know, uh, as in making it appear as just a sort of a theater of chaos, uh, uh, um, um, uh, a, 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 a comedy, even, you know, something like that, or at least a tragedy, tragic comedy farce, something like that. And that's presently what it looks like. And in that in that context, of course, the real casualty here all the time will be democracy. Look at the state of America and what's going to emerge after that. It really doesn't matter who emerges as the next president in, in, in the US. It's already as it were, sunk, uh, torpedoed below the waterline, it seems, you know, like it would be extraordinarily difficult to re-legitimate the core institutions and so on. And that's the great danger with, by the way, Carl Schmitt, of course, was the political philosopher uh, of the Weimar era that basically wrote the script for enabling the rise of the Third Reich, you know, that this is a chaos and what we need is, uh, you know, the basis on which uh, Fortinbras, in, in this case, the authoritarian leader uh, enters and so on. And, and Schmidt has been the playbook for the Republican Party uh, since um, uh, going, going, going back at least to uh, George Bush, uh, uh, second George Bush, George W. Bush and so on. So uh, that, that's the prelude. I can offer a story that will be an alternative to that, but I can't do it in 30 seconds. But if anybody wants to write to me, no problem. I'll, I'll, I'll send you work in progress. Thank you. OK, so um, uh, we're, we're uh, running out of time, not out of questions and not out of uh, topics to discuss. And um, so um, I'm, I'm uh, extremely grateful for the opportunity to uh, have this uh, far too short discussion with you, but all the more I, I look forward to its continuation and, and uh, deepening our discourse uh, so that we can uh, progress on deep institutional uh, innovation for sustainability and human development. Uh, we will now take a three minute uh, break, so that uh, will put us, uh, according to my clock, at sort of 57-58. Uh, that we're that we're going to reconvene uh, with the last panel for the day, and uh, we're taking a short break until then. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>